My history with nebulae and Blender is long and storied, and I haven't done a good breakdown of how I actually do them in Blender, despite many requests. So without further ado, here is the complete workflow I use for creating incredible nebulae inside of Blender. Enjoy! So let's start with a quick, comprehensive run-through of the process we will be utilizing here. Everything starts with a blank emissive cube. From there we are going to make it brighter at the center to simulate a point light being distributed in the volume. Next we're going to add some absorption to give it the impression of density. And from there we can introduce detail into the shader through noise textures. And we can see it gives us an exciting effect already, but there is no lighting. We will solve the lighting by introducing density samples along the path the light takes to the point light at the center, aka marching the rays to the light source. We can use some neat optimizations here to give it much more apparent detail. And since the point we march to is arbitrary, we can move it around all we like very easily. We can use this property to march different rays to different locations, giving us the effect of duplicating the light sources, which we will use for some sweet stars. Using a technique called dithering, we can reintroduce the center light source to illuminate the whole scene. From there, all we need to do is recolor it, reshape it, make it spherical, and blend the edges, and we have a fantastic nebula. This intro has been long enough already, but I do want to quickly cover some settings that we'll be using throughout this tutorial. So one of the most relevant is Blender 3.4 and Cycles. We will also, for the volumes, is the most relevant render setting. I have it set to 0.1 on the step rate for both the render and the viewport. This is a good balance between it looking good in the viewport and it performing well in the viewport, which is an important balance to strike. Here I have shown some samples of different volume step rates, the render times, and just how they look so you can gauge what's appropriate for you and your machine. So with that being said, let's go into our shadier editor and get started. So I have a basic material set up. This is just an emission shader connected to the material output in the volume slot. And in the world, I just set the strength of this background shader to zero. So, the first order of business is to get ourselves a basic point light set up. We cannot use a regular light object because we are not using scattering, meaning that the shader will not interact with the scene lights. So we have to do it in math. And there are two ways we can do it. And it really just depends on the different coordinate systems we want to use. You can either use the object coordinates or the position coordinates. The difference is that if we move around the position coordinates, they are going to stay the same respective to the world origin. So if we move it down, you can see it's, there's going to be less blue there. The object coordinates, on the other hand, are relative to the object, as their name implies. So they will not change. How we get a basic point light going if we connect one of these into the emission shader, you can see we sort of get a nice effect of a point light illuminating the surroundings. And that is because if we take the length of the position vector, which is essentially just saying the distance from 0, 0, 0, the world origin, multiplying it by a certain value to either shrink or scale it up, and then taking the inverse square, which is putting it to the power of negative 2, we get a realistic light fall off. Now here's where the difference comes in, because as you might guess, if we move the cube around here, the point light is going to stay in the same position. But if we move the cube around now with this coordinate system, the point light will shift with the cube. So this is mainly up to personal preference, but for this tutorial, I'm going to be using the geometry position output because it allows us to control which 
portion of the cube we are looking at. This is good for look dev purposes. So I've set up this basic material as a ground truth reference for our shader. We need it to look a bit more like this before we can really move on. But we don't want to implement all the volume shadows right now because that's a little bit complicated. We'll come back to that later. So I've implemented this slightly more complicated material, but also this fits our needs a little bit better as it eliminates all the volume shadows through isolating only the camera rays. So if we turn this up, you see we want it to occlude the light in the camera rays. We don't need it to include all the light rays just yet, i.e. shadows. So let's see what our material can do if we add this to it, which I'll explain in one second. So as we increase the density, we can see that we get this effect, which as you might remember, it's very similar to the one that we got here. All we are doing here, you're taking this density input, you're plugging this into the color. So essentially we are multiplying it by this lighting info. And then we are normalizing it, subtracting it from the one, one, one vector and then putting it into a length node, which is going to take essentially the magnitude of this. So because this is just a scalar, this is going to return about 17.9. It's a little bit different, but for our purposes, this is all that matters. All this does is it basically gives us a little bit of an easier way to interface with this volume absorption because Blender's volume absorption node is massaged a bit so that's easy to work with for more standard uses and we are not using it in the standard capacity. Now, the reason why we have vectors here is because density is not actually a scalar. Density is a vector. So if we add in a RGB node, and I'm going to duplicate our vector math and set it to scale. And we're gonna scale this by our density we can see that this is actually going to look pretty neat. If I put it to a blue value, for instance, you can see it's going to absorb all the blue light and give us a more red um, interior. And we can see that this reflects, this is reflected in this test shader as well. If we put this into a bit of a blue light, we're gonna get less blue light coming back at us. So this is a basic volume scattering setup that does not contain any volume lighting. That is what we will be tackling next, right after we add a little bit more in terms of density, because we want to be able to make these shadows more visible to us when we actually implement them, because that helps us test the lighting a bit better. So for that, I have added in this very basic setup. There's just two noise textures connected to each other, one at scale one, scale five, different dent or different details, different roughnesses, plugged into a color ramp, multiplied by an obscenely high value, and then added a slight amount of ambient density. If we plug this into here, you can see it's going to look like this. So we've got a little bit more of a complexity in terms of our density. And this will be interesting to see shadows of. So let's next figure out how we are going to implement shadows in a system that doesn't interact with lights. And it's going to be a slightly complicated, but ultimately manageable if you know a few basic things, which we'll be covering next. So to tackle volume lighting, I have this basic demonstration set up. I have a series of them actually. So we have this initial value and then we have this node group, which is essentially just a function. And all that function does is it takes the input, it adds 0.1 to it, and then it puts that into the output. So I take this input of zero. Let's preview this. I mute this, you see it returns zero. This is 0.1 and if I duplicate that, you see it's going to get, keep getting brighter and brighter and brighter, right? 
Now we can do this with vectors too. We can really do it with anything. So if I take this vector, let's say I'm using the position input. So this is just without any augmentation. And you can see I'm adding a little bit of red to it. If I keep doing this, you can see I'm adding more and more and more red to it. I'm just slowly shifting it, right? You can see this is now vastly different than that. So what we can do is we can take this concept, this is literally the exact same function, with this strap to it. So essentially we're doing the same thing as we're doing up here, and then adding a little bit of this. So we take an initial vector, and then we're going to add a little bit to that vector, and then we're going to sample a texture at that point, and we're going to add that to uh, this input. And we're going to pass that back out into the this factor output. So if you can see, don't want. Oh, I've just done something funny. All right, there we go. So this factor output is the same as this one. This factor output. This is where it gets interesting. Now we've created these streaks. And here's how we're going to create this volume lighting. Because if we plug this into the volume, you can see this, which is pretty cool. But if I say duplicate this, I'm going to copy this, I'm going to paste it. Let's plug it down here. Don't need that. Let's plug this into the position. Then we're going to do math, multiply. By this looks like gibberish right now but if I do something like uh, power and then plug that into the exponent maybe I add some multiplies and stuff you can see it's a little bit hard to see without absorption by shader add shader Where is it? Volume absorption. Let's plug this into the density. Along with this. Still a little bit hard to see. Maybe we can up this to like 100. We're getting some volume light. It's very, very rough. Right, but you can see we're sort of getting some shadows along there. Like it's only appearing at the side that's facing in the positive x, or actually, I guess technically negative x direction. Oh, wait, no, never mind, positive x. That's very hard to see. And we're going to be able to do something a little bit better than this. Um, but this is the basic principle we're operating on. So if I go back up here, what we essentially need to do is we need to march the point. Let's say we're, we are we got a point on right here. We need to sample at certain points along this ray from the light source to that point. And then we need to collect all our volume data from there. And then multiply it by the light source or by the density value. And then that will give us our lighting information least in the basic sense. So I'm going to set this up really quickly and then I will get back to you. So I'm going to start off simple with this. So I've made a slight few alterations to the uh, initial file. This is rather standard. All I've done is I've collapsed this density map into a node group because we're going to need to reference it. And I've split the color and the extinction um, and I'm just using scale maps or scale operations so I can change the color and the extinction separately. So if I turn this to red, I can get a little bit more red there. Pretty standard stuff. Then I'm using, I'm subtracting one or 
are subtracting this from one, and then I'm using the scale just to scale this scalar value by this vector value, and I'm plugging that into the extinction, and I'm just using this color one to plug into the color. And then everything else I believe is the same. Uh, just extinction is being plugged into this absorption setup, and then color is plugged into the emission. So let's get into the actual uh, volume lighting. So you can see it's more or less the same thing with this at the bottom. So let's see what it looks like. Now you can see my viewport performance drastically um, plummeted. This is where it's important to change your step rate so that you can actually see stuff going on. But let's explain what's going on here. So all of the lighting, which is this, this is what's computing the lighting, is connected via a multiply node. If I turn this off, it's the exact same thing as this. The only difference in here is I changed the length up here to a distance. Now length is just distance from 0, 0, 0, but distance means that we can use two vectors so we can change the light position. And we can see, if we plug this multiply back in, like in the demo in the intro, we can change the light position. So let's explain what's actually going on here. We're using essentially the exact same principle as the last demo that we did a couple minutes ago except we've expanded upon it a little bit it's still rather simple but now we have a couple more inputs and outputs to this so we start with the vector this is just the position vector at which we start the ray and then the step vector is essentially where how far we want to march the ray and in what direction so we can see we want to march it to the light position. So we subtract this input position from the light position, and that's our step vector. We also have the samples input. This allows us to have a little bit more control if you want to remove a sample um, or a step, is what I'm calling them here, or not. So essentially what we're doing is we're collecting this extinction data, and we're just adding it all up right and then we're plugging it into this function which is just a vector extension of like a power node just raising 0.5 to the power of each channel in this extinction because the extinction is just a measure of how much stuff we've gone through so we need it to occlude the light properly and that's why we're using this and then we are multiplying that by the light setup we have for the point light. What's actually going on in these shadow steps? So as you can see, it's rather similar to the stuff that we were doing before, except it's a, we've got a couple more steps. So we have a vector, we have a step vector, and we have the samples. So we're adding a portion of the step vector to the vector each time, and then that is going into the output to be reevaluated in the next step. So it goes from the input, gets added, and then gets out, and then we're doing the same thing eight times. Now we are dividing this by the samples plus one. This is because we if we want to dither the ray along this, uh, or if we want to dither the samples along the ray, we don't want it to shoot past the light. And if we have eight samples, it's always the end position is always going to be exactly at the light, and we don't necessarily want that. This is a little bit complicated, but and you don't really need to know the details. I just add one. You probably don't really need it though. Anyways, let's keep moving on. So we're dividing it by the step vector because we only want to reach the light position at the last. Uh, sample, right? So it should take us eight steps to reach that light position. Then we're taking the length of that, sampling the extinction, the density map, which is just these noise textures connected here. We're scaling that by this length because this is a density, essentially how much stuff per unit length. 
So we got to scale it by the actual length, right? And then we are adding the extinction that we were measuring previously back to this new extinction. And then we keep marching that along. So we're sampling the extinction and adding it up eight times. And this gets fed into that, this function. This then gets multiplied by the light strength. And then gets, that gets multiplied by the color. And that goes into our emission. And we can see we get nice shadows. They're a little bit rough around the edges. But we can see we get the impression of it. And as a plus, we can also change the color of them. Which is always neat. Anyways, we can see this doesn't give us the most detail, and if we want more, we will need to add some more stuff. And I'm going to start with a very simple optimization. Well, not really optimization, just a very simple trick that's going to give us a little bit more detail around these denser regions. That is going to be, I'm going to take a vector math node, put, it into the, put the color into there, then we're going to take the length of that, and then we're going to use a map range node, which is right here. And we're essentially going to map it from 0 to 250. And I'm going to mark, I'm going to set it to be like 2 min, like 0.1, and then, I don't know, 5. And then we are going to scale the color by this. And we can see this gives us a lot more detail around those denser regions. But this also doesn't look very clean. So next, we're going to introduce an optimization to clean it up. I'm going to implement that, and then I will circle back around to you guys to show you how it works. So here is a Desmos setup that I'm using to sort of illustrate the optimization we're going to be making to get more detail. So imagine this is your starting point. This is the point you want to find the lighting of at this origin here. And imagine this is the point of the light source. And these dots represent your samples along that. So if you have a really dense volume and you're only sampling uh, from here to here, right? You aren't getting any detail from anything immediately surrounding the volume. And that's reflected in our texture if we change this N to 1, which is essentially just the same thing we're going to be using. We see we get a lot of this weird stuff happening around here. Um, there's no lighting. It looks very strange. But if we use this way of getting the light samples and distributing them, which is essentially just scaling down the ones closest to it and then sort of distributing these along the remaining um, points in the light and the volume, we can get something really interesting. So check this out. So as I increase the N, we get more and more samples closer, but we still get a few out here. And it's actually, they're so close that you can barely see them. So this is really good for sampling volumes because you get the immediate close-up shadows, and then you also get the far away shadows from the stuff that is around here, even though these are admittedly less precise, but they're still there. So back into Blender, we're going to see what happens when we increase n. This is the same n that this is this. So as I increase n, you can see we get more and more detail in the shadows. Usually 3 to 4 is what I would recommend for this, although it doesn't really matter. And you can see we get very nice shadows in there. If we zoom in. Let's center ourselves. Let's render this region so it renders a little bit faster. You can see we get a lot of volume detail in there. So this is the implementation that we have just described in Desmos, but it's in node form. And there's a few things that we need for this. 
So we need to alter the node group inputs and outputs slightly. We don't need to have this right now, but that is something that we need eventually. Actually, let's use let's use four for n. That's a little bit better. Um, so this used to be the divide node. We were dividing by the samples plus one. I took out the plus one, the add node in here because we didn't need it anymore. So essentially we're doing a power of negative one on the samples. It just inverts it, right? So eight goes to one eight. And then we're using this counter to determine, to let the shader know which sample we are in. So this counter starts at zero and it adds one each time. So zero plus one outputs one, inputs one plus one outputs two, right? Then we're taking this, we're multiplying it by 1 8, which is the samples. And then we are, well, we're multiplying the um, counter plus 1 by this, and then we're also multiplying the regular counter by this. And then we're raising it to the power of n, which is 4. You can see we have two power nodes, both of them are connected up like that. And then we're subtracting this set of operations, um, well, we're subtracting this set of operations from these ones, and then we're scaling the step vector by that much. So this is gonna start out as a really small value and then it's gonna slowly increase and then it will converge to one by the end of this. And then everything else is the same. Um, and if I didn't explain it last time, I think I did, but these are just being passed right through because these are constants. Um, and then everything else is being updated. Uh, so now, the reason why we have this white noise is we want to change this counter a little bit so that basically if we have... Um, uh, we want to sort of dither the rays along the volumes. We don't always want to be sampling the same points just so we can get a better distribution. And it's not going to make too huge of an effect, but it's just good practice. And then we can see we have some nice volume lighting. We can move this around, right? And then if I do something like, I don't know, bring in a, say, Voronoi texture, you put that in here. The astute among you are going to be guessing what I'm going to be doing next. <laughs> yeah, so we want some stars, right? So we're going to be using the Voronoi texture to figure out our light positions. That's going to be replaced. That's going to be replacing this. So if we take that out. And add in texture, Voronoi texture. Add in our uh, geometry. We can position in there. Maybe change the scale down a little bit. Then, if we use this position output, we're gonna see something pretty neat is gonna happen. Suddenly, we have a bunch of stars that are casting light. Maybe we should lower this down a little bit so we can see a little bit more of what's going on here. Now isn't that cool? Let's change this a little bit. I added in a power node here so we can control how much haze there is. I changed it to two to get a little bit sharper results. And we can see how our shader is holding up. We want about 1.5. It's all about tweaking those values, right? You know. Turn that up. And get more and more and more. And you can really have as much fun as you want with this. It's very nice. Um. Yeah.
Let's change this a little bit. Just sort of messing around with this. Play around with it until you find something you like. But you can see now we have a bunch of stars that are casting light on it. But maybe you've seen the problem already. That sometimes we have very harsh boundaries like up there. So what we can do is we can solve that by essentially just slightly blurring the position of this so that we get some blurry edges. We're going to use that. We're going to do that by adding in a white noise texture and then just very subtly adding it to this Voronoi texture. Um, but because we want to add it from both sides, uh, we need to subtract 0.5 so that instead of adding what is essentially averages to like one, we're going to add, we're going to sort of center it around zero. So if I um, subtract 0.5 from this, we can see as the sampling converges, it, it gets smaller and smaller. Um, and then we don't want to add this too much. We only want to slightly blur it. So we want to scale it by, I don't know, maybe 0.05 and converter vector math and then add this back in. And we'll see when we preview this. Uh, the hard edges are mostly gone. You don't really see them anymore. You can see a little bit of funny business happening over there. Um, but you can, maybe 0.1 is good for that. Yeah, now we have a bunch of stars. But the thing is, I kind of liked the center point light. So let's find a way to add that back in. Now, if we mix these together, oh, we don't want an effect of math. Let's do converter mix, maybe we'll go to vector. Take a second to think about what's going to happen if we mix these together. All right, restart in the three, two, one. Have you made your predictions? Let's let's try it out. Let's start with all um, Voronoi. It's the same thing. Let's slowly change it. That's pretty cool. Where'd our stars go? Huh. Now you know, by the way, how I made that effect in the intro. I just animated that factor. So we're still going to want to mix these, but we want them to either be one or zero, right? Because mixing between these doesn't actually like duplicate the light source. Um, it just changes the location at where it's at. So if we use another white noise texture, and this time I'm going to, I don't want these to be the exact same. So I'm going to add a little bit to it. I'm going to do convert and math and greater than 0.5. I'm gonna plug that in. Now it's a little bit hard to see because our every light is like equally bright. So I'm gonna also use, I'm gonna duplicate this big mix node. I'm gonna change this to float. And I'm gonna multiply this by our light strength. By 10. Say we want this to be, I don't know, 10 times as bright as it is, and this to be a tenth as bright as that is. We can see we now get the global light, which is the light from the center, and then we also get the star's light. We can turn this off if we want to isolate the light from the center. Turn this off if we want to isolate the light from the stars, which is really neat. Um, anyways, this is basics of how all that works. Um, next, we need to finalize it by shaping this into a respectable uh, shape instead of just a cube, even though if you just plop your camera inside and render out like an HDRI, it'll be fine. That's pretty simple. So let's real quick um, finalize this up by adding some color. Uh, a bit of shape distortion in the center, like I showed in the intro. And then also, we can make it spherical. So, let's start by the easiest thing, which is going to be making it spherical and sort of blending the edges. So I'm going to go into edit mode here, and W to subdivide it, and just do it a couple times. 
Shift Alt S and press one to spherify it. Nice. And then if we go into item, we set the dimensions back to two and apply the scale. You can see now it is spherical. Anyways, now let's sort of blend these edges and we can do that by taking this vector and then we're going to do a vector math and then a length. And then we're going to multiply this whole thing by a color ramp that we're going to plug into there. I'm just going to duplicate that one, flip it. Um, and then we don't need B spline, we can just do ease. And I'm going to multiply it by this, which gives us a fade out on those edges, which is really cool. And we can also, if we want that to be a little bit stronger, you can add a power node and we can mess around with that. And we can just change sort of generally speaking how dense it is. All right, so now we've shaped our nebula properly. You can see some of the funny business happening around here. That's pretty cool. Um, it's sort of a matter of personal preference if you want that. I don't really care. Um, if you want to, though, you can certainly multiply this by that, and that gets rid of a lot of it. And you might want to... Um, Instead of multiplying this entire thing by that, just multiply this bit and then change the values a little bit. So that works a little better. Either way, that is cool. Um, let's just multiply it by this. I think that works fine. And I think we messed up the scale a little bit, so I'm going to just do another vector math and multiply or actually scale by two. Uh, that gives us a little bit more detail. Maybe we don't want to. Maybe like 1.7. That's pretty cool. I'm sure all y'all are wondering how I did that twist effect in the intro. So let's tackle that right now after we do some color correction. So using this setup, if I change this to blue, I'm going to set this one to be a little bit more red right there. We can get some very neat color gradients. And I don't really like the scale of the Voronoi texture, so I'm going to change this up to like 3. Maybe this down to like a 106. It's all about just finding the right values, you know. That's all it is really in these things. Maybe add a little bit more ambient density, you know, all that fun stuff. Anyways, let's do the twist. So that was all done by a vector rotate node. And I just set the axis to something arbitrary like 111. And then used the length. And then I just did the math, add... 0.01, just so that wasn't completely going to nuke itself at the center. And then I used a power node. I believe I used negative one. And then a multiply by 0.1. And this plugged into the angle. 
It's a little bit hard to see it now. Maybe if I plug it in, you can see a little bit of that happening. But really what made it shine was the fact that I uh, sort of shrunk it down near the center. So I, essentially what I did is I did a scale operation. And I just did power like negative 0.5, I think. And I just scaled that in there and that sort of made everything fall down close to the center. Maybe if I turn this up, you can see a little bit better. Yeah, there it is. I'm just sort of messing with that value to get something that looks respectable. And there you go. That is a quick nebula. I think we did pretty good on time. This is only like 30 something minutes, right? So if you want the project files, the ones directly for this tutorial are not on my Patreon, but I have a better nebula shader that's way more polished than this that is on my Patreon for the $25 tier. I leave, I'll leave a link to the video that I used to advertise it in the description if you want to check it out. But if you want to make your own, this is a pretty good resource. So with that, I hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you guys later. It was a pleasure teaching you guys how to do this, and I hope to see some of your cool renders. Join the Discord and post them there. Um, I'm really excited to see what you guys come up with with this. I hope you all have a fantastic day, and I'll see you guys later. Peace.